So for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Brian O'Connor. I'm uh, the technical lead for the Stratum project at uh, Open Networking Foundation. And I'm also uh, involved with the reference design team for the UPAN project. Uh, UPAN stands for Unified Programmable and Automated Networking. Um, and I'm going to provide just a little bit of uh, motivation as well as uh, some of the design tenants before turning it over to our, our main speakers. Uh, we're going to uh, start to talk about some of the components that we've started to build and integrate uh, for this next generation platform. Um, so the first thing is just a brief re uh, retrospective. Um, and the, um, the first thing I want to talk about is just some of the things we've learned from the initial versions of uh, our SDN architecture, SDN v1, if you will. And overgeneralizing and simplifying uh, what we've done in SDN v1 is we've primarily been responsible for or building systems that adapt to existing heterogeneous hardware. What I mean by this is we're adapting to the models that come from the device uh, vendors. We're adapting to the pipelines of the ASICs uh, and switching chips that are on the device. We're adapting to the protocols uh, that are on the device. And a lot of the heavy lifting and a lot of the, the uh, engineering effort and work in SDN version one has been primarily building these ad adapters, protocol layers, and drivers to present abstractions of a network, to, pr to provide a global network view that we can start to build uh, control plane applications on. If we look at the first generation of network fun functions virtualization, uh, what we see is uh, a theme around virtualization. Uh, taking the stuff that we already had in our network and putting it in VNFs and running it on commodity compute. Uh, we've used common uh, virtual uh, infrastructure managers like OpenStack and Kubernetes. We have orchestrators that we've built like XOS, uh, OPNFE. Um, and, and primarily here, the theme is adapt and virtualize. But we haven't really looked at how does a network get built differently if you were to, um, to design it around some of the scale requirements and some of the agility requirements that we've heard about in previous keynotes. So some of the tenants we want to just talk about and some of the themes that you can expect to hear uh, as we go through uh, these various presentations are around prescription first. So instead of adaptation, we want to prescribe. We want to prescribe the configuration. We want to pre prescribe the pipeline definition, the forwarding state, and network intent. What this buys us is an unambiguous contract between a control plane and data plane. And it, it buys us an ability to write control plane applications that can do more than just uh, the least common denominator. We want to disaggregate. This means we want to disaggregate monolithic control planes. We also want to start to disaggregate some of the network functions uh, that we just stuck into to VMs or containers and, and deployed on x86. What this buys us is an ability to place functions on the right hardware and in the right spot in the network, rather than just being um, using compute and memory uh, to inform scheduling decisions. We can also start to take advantage of. Uh, being network aware, what are the bandwidth and latency requirements for a specific function? Is CPU the right choice of hardware? Does this belong on FPGA? Does it belong on, on a next generation ASIC? The next theme is unify. So in, those pre in the previous picture, when we look at SDN or NFV, they're always vertical silos. And one of the things we want to start to do is, is take some of those SDN pieces and deploy them on our compute infrastructure and take some of the compute management, uh, the VIM, uh, the VNF orchestrator, and start to integrate that into our, our SDN platform so that uh, some of the things like uh, scheduling for, for bandwidth or latency uh, can start to be, to, to be uh, informing placement uh, decisions and scale decisions. Additionally, this simplifies deployment and it improves our resource utilization. Instead of having to have two different systems, uh, one for our, our network fabric or underlay and the other for our, our overlay, our network functions, and our, our user plane services, uh, we, can, we can reuse this architecture. It gives us end-to-end -end visibility. Uh, that, that's also uh, part of our, our third tenant, which is build. We want to build uh, that tool chain, um, leveraging uh, data plane analytics and telemetry, uh, so that we can start to, to debug, verify, and upgrade our network in seamless ways. This is essential uh, for the type of rapid innovation, the velocity that we've been talking about. Uh, you've heard Comcast talk about it, AT&T talk about it, China, China Mobile talk about it, uh, DT talk about it. But in order to, to enable this, this sort of rapid infrastructure transformation, we need to trust that the network's doing what, uh, what we say it's going to do, and we need to be able to do upgrades in a, in a zero touch or hitless way. This is gonna provide improved reliability and availability and enable that uh, innovation. So these are the types of themes uh, that you should expect to see in the next com coming set of talks. Um, 
I think uh, hopefully these answers, uh, you'll see answers clearly. If, if not, these, these are also some things to, to think about and, and question uh, when, when you start to see uh, next generation solutions. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Jim Wanderer from Google. He's a director of engineering uh, who's been working on uh, network infrastructure there for about 12 years now. All right, thanks. So thanks for the introduction. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about why we're involved with Stratum OS and what we're looking at it to do and why we approach it the way we did. Um, I think everybody knows Google has very large data centers with uh, very large scale compute. Here's a picture of some random data center looking down the aisle, and we have all these machines that need to be networked. And one thing about Google software load, it's highly distributed, which causes a lot of network load. Uh, when I first started working on this, we couldn't buy the uh, performance and scale we needed. So we started building our own things. And that's for traffic inside the data center. There's also a huge need for traffic between data centers, right? We need to distribute data globally, and there was a need to build very high capacity wide area networks. And for this type of wide area network, this is actually pretty simple, right? You don't need a big complicated internet router to build this. So we could build something much cheaper and optimize for high bandwidth um, ourselves. And at that time, you couldn't, you couldn't buy what we needed, so we built it. And then we moved to using SDN. SDN allowed us to do centralized control. Uh, and you know, that was uh, uh, you know, not in uh, fashion at all at the times, but we found that centralized control would let us do specific optimizations, right? It would let us do certain topologies, it would give us a certain a, a desired scale and performance, and allow us to have precise control over how the network behaves. And in particular, making sure that failures are handle it, handled as gracefully as possible. When your scale's big enough, I'm sure a lot of people here know this, something's always breaking. And you have to accept the breaks and continue working with a graceful degradation. At the time, we used OpenFlow. And this was a big win. It, uh, we were able to use a lot of open source software and build our systems based on OVS and modified it to work against hardware. And this was the foundation for everything we did. It enabled um, our centralized SDN. We started, as we progressed, we started running into problems, right? We found that OpenFlow didn't give us everything we wanted to fully ex uh, uh, exploit what the hardware, the features of these chips. And so we had to do some funny workarounds. We had to do some customizations and extensions to get the performance, get the functionality we wanted. And we found the more we did, the more complicated the protocol got. And um, then we ran into these programmable chips and we thought, well, how are we gonna make use of these uh, with OpenFlow? And we ended up in a state where we have this proprietary implementation and we can't buy anything that to build our network. So we could not leverage industry. And then, you know, instead of being able to do things ourselves, we had to do things ourselves. And that's not the state we want to be in. So uh, we stepped back and looked at this and we thought, well, what if we propose a standard set of interfaces that would deliver us exactly what we want? So, you know, P4 runtime being almost an open flow 2.0, uh, you know, and with APIs that are defined by P4 programs. So strong definitions, well-defined, standard, but flexible. Uh, and different chips work differently, and you don't want to expose those differences to your controller. You don't want to have special cases in your controller to worry about uh, you know, totally heterogeneous environment because that's going to make it very difficult to add new types of uh, hardware and different vendors. So P4 runtime, we're looking to give us some vendor abstraction. The P, that, what does that mean? That means a P4 program being exposed to your SDN controller, it doesn't have to be exactly what the program is that's running on the, the ASIC. The ASIC could be a fixed function with a slightly different pipeline. It could be a programmable chip with a slightly different program. That way, but the important thing is, that is abstracted, those differences are abstracted to your controller. And this is an important point to do that. Uh, and you know, 
we use fixed function chips, right? So some people say I don't want to use P4 runtime because I don't use P4 chips. Well, there's no need to use a programmable chip. Our, we're looking at P4 um, runtime to provide all the functionality on top of fixed function chips and then future proof us for the use of programmable chips. And then the other half of this is open config. Um, we adopted that. It was something that was um, moving along on its, uh, on its own just fine. And we thought, hey, if we can uh, define exactly the models that we need for configuration monitoring telemetry out of a standard box and just what we need, um, that'll give us the APIs that are needed. So, well, how do we get that? And, you know, this could be something that is completely proprietary to us, but then that doesn't really solve the problem, right? We want to be able to go out and buy this. Um, so, we partnered with the ONF, started the Stratum project to make a open and minimal production-ready distribution, uh, and I'm so pleased with the group of operators and vendors that have joined. Now, this isn't an easy thing. New standards are hard, but having an open source, vendor neutral reference implementation that can be delivered on white boxes, I think, is um, going to really give us the industry direction and drive that we want. And then we're looking at it that these interfaces will be such that we have a lot of choice from a lot of different vendors, whether it be white box or you know, traditional black box, if we can support these interfaces in a way that they could just drop into our fabrics. That gives us a lot more agility in providing solutions to our internal customers. Our next speaker is Thomas Vachuska. He's the chief architect for Onos at, at ONF, and he's gonna be uh, talking about uh, how Onos is evolving uh, to meet these requirements. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, as Brian said, I'm, I'm Thomas. I'm not just an architect, but also a developer of Onos. And so uh, throughout, over the last four years, we basically uh, spent, uh, spent working kind of in a paradigm that Brian described, which is adapting to what is, what the data plane does. And we came up, we were fairly successful in a sense that uh, we came up with an operating system which is able to adapt to all of these different protocols, is fast, is reliable, meaning it can, uh, it can absorb failures, um, it makes it easy to develop applications. Um, it's now been proven in a sense that it's entering production trials on a serious basis. Um, and clearly there's still more work to be done in that area, but it's a, it's a, a sign of a significant progress. Uh, we also have tremendous amount of uh, existing applications and extensions for this, not just necessarily drivers and providers for different protocols. Uh, but also full traffic steering applications such as Trellis. Um, now, um, with, the, with the protocols, I want to point out that not only we can be looking in the past, we have protocols that can do, you know, uh, the legacy protocols, but also it proved itself to be elastic to, to adapt itself to a lot of the new protocols such as P4 runtime, uh, GNMI, GNOI, all of these are being developed on the existing platform and you can actually see them in many of the cubes on a, on a floor. But it's all great, but let's not rest on our laurels. We also recognize that there are some opportunities uh, and some caveats and limitations. So we can do better. And we can do better, uh, you know, especially in the context of the fact that now that we realize that we can move more into a prescriptive world where the pipelines can be prescribed, where the operation of the data plane can be more dictated, we can actually jettison some of the complexity that was built up in trying to adapt to world. And we can simplify. And we can also have the history that tells us uh, what is required and what is not, what is important, what is not. And so, um, looking at some of the aspects of the architecture that ONOS currently has, there are some, there are some limitations. For example, we have a limited isolation mechanism which impacts not, uh, you know, our ability to have tenant-specific applications, which impacts our ability to be able to have uh, horizontal service scaling and, uh, and things of that sort. And so also there's a lot of software that was developed that really in retrospect ended up not being used. And so, with that, um, let's take a look at uh, what, what the future might be. 
So we've currently released ONOS 2.0, which upgrades uh, Java, upgrades uh, Apache Carafe, and provides a nice stable platform on top of which a lot of the functionality is still continues to be developed. And so rather than throwing large ponds in that fairly stable pool right now, the idea is to keep the existing architecture going uh, uh, for, for development, for continued development, and use that opportunity to start looking ahead. How can we build a solution using kind of new building materials that can um, basically sustain and advance the industry uh, in more long term? And uh, effectively with st Stratum that Jim just described, the Stratum initiative, effectively that's a, that's, that's a data plane component of the overall UPAN um, uh, reference design. And so the time is to ask the question, what is going to be the control plane? Well, the next generation on us is going to be the control plane for, for UPAN. And so let's build it. Um, how are we going to build it? Uh, the idea is to decide on some kind of foundational tenets and principles and adhere to them. Now, a lot of these tenets are inherited from um, kind of from the experience of the past. Some remain uh, carried over from the past and some remain, uh, and some are changed from based on experience from the past. So for example, adoption of general purpose, um, remote uh, procedure interfaces and standard interfaces and open interfaces. So things like open config, GNMI, GNOI, uh, P4 runtime are going to be central to the new architecture. Also, rather than being uh, forced to be in Java or, or JVM based languages, we decided to make it uh, based on microservices to be able to take advantage of the new uh, open source software suites that are available, for example, like Kubernetes and Helm charts. And this allows us to divest in some of the systems that we had to build up from scratch before. Now we can jettison those and just inherit and, and build more on the third party um, solutions that already exist out there and uh, invest in areas where progress needs to be made. Of course, we do intend to reuse code um, as appropriate. For example, we've had investments in distributed systems like Atomics, for example. We've, uh, we have nice uh, Onos UI, which is, being, uh, which is built using modern technologies and being retrofitted even. For, for, let's say, TypeScript and uh, Angular 7, we're gonna carry that over. Uh, but we're only gonna pick pieces that suit the new architecture and leave the other ones behind. Uh, the idea is to also, from the get-go, to focus on issues which are on features that are essential for deployments, because we do intend this stuff to go into production and leave behind stuff that history has told us that are not really necessary. And finally, also it'll, and this is not necessarily critical, but it'll allow components to be written much more loosely uh, apart from each other, potentially in multiple different languages, and be able to be stitched together uh, using, the, using better frameworks. Anyway, that's kind of all I had to say. So we're gonna start on this journey in uh, actually start of new year, and we're gonna do this completely in the open with the community. Um, with, we're hoping with great help from the community. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Thomas. And our next speaker is going to be Saurav Das. He's a um, distinguished engineer at ONF who's been primarily driving the uh, Trellis uh, work uh, so far. Thanks, Thanks Brian. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the next generation of Trellis, as you know, that is built on uh, top of ONOS. Uh, and you just heard about the next generation of ONOS, so I want to shed some light on what we plan to do here. So. Uh, a quick introduction, Trellis is a leaf spine fabric. Uh, I like to call it a multi-purpose leaf spine fabric and it's designed for NFE. So to give you a quick idea, if you think about it, okay, uh, these large operators typically have head ends or central offices that are bigger and then stuff the, that is closer to the end user in regional uh, central offices or secondary head ends. So if you have the access devices, they uh, connect directly to the leaf switches uh, but there's no compute in these secondary uh, head ends or central offices, right? Uh, the compute environment is actually in the upstream central office. So the, the access devices connect to the leaves, leaves connect to spines, spines from these multiple secondaries connect to uh, sec uh, the spines in the primary um, central office. That then connects to redundant leaves or what we call paired leaves. 
uh, and that's where all the compute infrastructure connects to it, right? So it could be dual homed hosts, single homed hosts, appliances, and so on. And also then that needs to connect to the upstream network, uh, the metro router or the core routers, okay? So very quickly, this is an overview uh, of Trellis. Uh, it's built on bare metal hardware uh, and open source software, and of course it's STN based, so it's built on top of ONOS. So now I'd like to dig a little bit deeper to show you how we've built um, uh, Trellis. So today it's built on top of uh, ONOS, as you can see, all the applications, all the features that Trellis provides, and I've only listed a few of them over there. That's on top of an ONOS cluster that communicates using OpenFlow and NetCon uh, to switches um, which have Broadcom ASICs inside and software from Broadcom, specifically one that is known as OFDPA. What OFTPA does is that it provides an abstraction. Basically, it provides a pipeline on top of a variety of Broadcom ASICs, right? Trident, Tomahawk, and Qumrans, right? Now, if you're familiar with these ASICs, actually the Trident Tomahawk line is very different from the Qumran, uh, so the pipelines are very different. But Broadcom, with its OFTPA software, takes care of those differences and provides what is essentially this one pipeline to which uh, the, the uh, Trellis programs, okay? This works great, right? So this, uh, this is, uh, as you've heard earlier uh, today from Comcast, it's, uh, it's in trials. And, um, but what happens if uh, a different vendor, right? A different vendor with a different switch, with a different pipeline comes into this picture, okay? That makes life hard. Now, uh, how do I write applications that can program two significantly different pipelines to uh, achieve these uh, features? So this is a problem that, not in Trellis, but a few years ago I had faced in a different uh, ONF project, and at that time, what we did is we introduced a fudge factor, right? We, we call it flow objectives for lack of a better term. But the idea here was the applications need to be written only once, right, to a very generic pipeline, just say three stages, uh, which is you see up there. You write the applications to a very generic pipeline, and then under the hood, uh, you have drivers for different uh, pipelines. So it's the job of the driver to understand the intent of these applications, the objective of these applications, and then translate them to the actual device uh, that is, uh, uh, or the device's pipeline. So we did this work. Um, in fact, uh, we have a demonstration two doors down um, uh, where we actually have a, um, a trellis, uh, the same topology that you saw on my previous slide. Uh, we have five OFTPA based switches and five P4 based switches uh, running in, uh, with this architecture, right? So I strongly encourage you to take some time and go and look at that demo. It's the noisiest one in that room, okay? So, um, but there are issues. There are certainly issues with this, right? So what happens is that, you know, we want to say that the application is writing to a very generic pipeline, but that's not entirely true. The applications really have a very good idea of what they want to do in that pipeline. We are intentionally obfuscating that so, that's, that's, um, so that the drivers can actually map it to the re real tables in the real pipelines. So it's now great to start with. Uh, the flow objectives layer itself is another layer of complexity. It started out very simple, but over time it has become more and more complicated as the needs of the system grew. And then it also makes it very difficult to write local agents or say local controllers that run on the hardware itself. And we know from experience that uh, uh, local agents actually help and contribute uh, a lot to scaling the system. But if I try to write a local agent on top of OFDP, it looks completely different, uses completely different APIs than say on a, a, a different switch. So the, can we do better? Okay, and that's where Stram comes in, right? So that's where the next generation of uh, Trellis comes in. The idea over here, you've heard this word before in multiple talks that came before me, the idea is that the applications are not writing to some generic pipeline, they are prescribing the pipeline, right? And that pipeline is then um, imposed on the underlying hardware through P4, uh, the language, um, and then populated using P4 runtime. And then it is the stratum layer that then has to um, uh, actually map or uh, compile uh, that P4 program into the underlying uh, hardware, whether it's, uh, uh, say, uh, Broadcom-based ASICs or ASICs from, say, Tofino or, or, or Expliant. 
Okay? So this is what we think about in terms of uh, evolving trellis. What this also will help us do is that we will then be able to write these local agents that run on the hardware itself, and they're always writing to the same APIs, the stratum APIs, and therefore then are portable across multiple stratum hardware. Okay, so that's all I had, and uh, Ryan? Uh, our next speaker, um, Hans-Jörg uh, Kolbe from Deutsche Telekom, is gonna talk a little bit more about the uh, NFE piece, and he's uh, chief uh, engineer and uh, architect for uh, Domain 2, or for 4.0, sorry. 4.0, no, we you. have. Four. Sorry, 4.0. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Magenta again. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Um, actually, yesterday uh, when, I, when I looked at the, um, at the demos and after I had my first beer, I realized that the stuff that we had put together on vision slides a couple of years ago is now materializing. It's there. We have stacked network operating systems. We have a driver model. We have abstraction layers. Back then it was a idea of a couple of guys, but now it's there, it's working. And I was really happy, I was happy to see that. And um, the good thing for you guys is I brought another vision slide, so we still have something to work on. Um, now, um, here's a bit um, history, not history of mankind, but history in uh, networking. Um, I start with, um, with a phrase that says, is there one ring to rule them all? Um, I came on an airplane and I've watched, I think, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, everything on tiny screens, right? And so, um, but there's, there's this one thing, this one ring to rule them all. So we have one thing and we have to do everything with this thing. So when I started in networking uh, quite a while ago, it was not at uh, um, zero. That was when the Romans were active and my ancestors were still living in ca uh, caves. No, no, but it's, it was like um, end of the 90s. We had these black boxes and um, I'm, I'm, I don't want to talk about badly about black boxes. Black boxes are cool because there were so many um, highly skilled engineers that built these great routers and I had the pleasure to work on those routers. There, there was no manual, there was nothing. We, we, we just put them together and, and checked out what happened. Um, but there are some drawbacks of this. You have a vendor lock, you have uh, only the same technology and um, this, this slows down a bit innovation. And then um, with me being also part of that community, people said, let's do everything on x86. Because on x86, you have servers, you have uh, mass market production, everybody's using servers, uh, and the prices went down. And with servers, the nice thing is you can program whatever you want. If you want to take off GTP tunnels, you just do it, right? If you want to add PPP, uh, th that was like a wide open space ahead of us. Now, there was one problem, actually, and that reminds me of something that Guru said this morning. Guru, there is no such thing as a cost-cutting department in Deutsche Telekom that doesn't exist. Cost-cutting is easy. Everybody can do that. But there is something that uh, Rüdiger is a responsible manager for is cost engineering. Cost engineering is a completely different thing. Cost engineering means you look at a thing, at a technology, and you really dive deeply into it and you try to engineer a solution together with the guys that provide the technology to make this um, optimized to cost like power consumption but also for your capex and opex and i had the pleasure to join this team actually a while ago and i spent one and a half years there and i looked at x86 and i did cost modeling on data centers uh, with a use case that was uh, highly relying on fast data plane and the outcome of the cost modeling was not that great actually because everything had to go through the CPU, and the CPU is not the problem, the, the virtual switch. So, so you had all these things that add la added latency and were not really optimized for fast packet forwarding. Then in parallel, these guys uh, with the new generations of ASICs came around. And I tried to build network functions on ASICs, I think it was 2011 or so, and I miserably failed. So uh, we, we tried to write flow state into the ASICs and then we went for pizza, I came back and I was still writing flow states. Um, I sent people to the ONF to add uh, a second MAC header to OpenFlow and I didn't understand why people didn't want to do that, but the ASICs were not ready. But now we have programmable ASICs. We have, we saw already, we, we have the Kumans, we have the Tofinos, there's more. That's just great. So um, we figured out, um, why don't we combine this? There's no one ring to rule them all. Let's put the pieces together and use x86 where it makes sense and use programmable ASICs where it helps us. And the driver for that is not the cost cutting, it's the cost engineering, it's the cost that we have. 
and the efficiency. So one example for that, and there's going to be a talk this afternoon, I think at 3, uh, about the VRAS. Yeah, one of the examples for black boxes are these super duper VRAS uh, that you all know, like, like uh, you remember the Shasta, the Juniper MX, the Redbacks, and all those. Then people started to virtualize them, and now we see people, well, if we look at ourselves, for instance, um, we see people separating the control plane from the user plane and offloading the user plane to hardware programmable hardware. And there's only a slight difference to the previous slide. You can do the same thing with the EPC. And I'm so happy that August and team that they did this demo with the P gateway on a programmable chipset because this was once again a proof that this is all possible. Now, um, does this work? Okay. I already talked about these examples. So one example is, oh, I can just look here, that uh, in fixed access, you can offload the BNG functionality there. We have done a lot of work on that. And yeah, I'm doing, once again, advertising for my own talk. This works. You can see that at 3, I can talk a bit more. Mobile access. The ONF has done that. And I'm really happy for, for this prototype. Now, here's the vision slide that I talked about. And I, I had presented this somewhere. And I don't remember where, but it's roughly a year ago that I presented this already. But um, what we see with regards to um, fixed mobile convergence and, um, f yeah, uh, and consolidation and in the light of 5G, if you look at this chart from uh, bottom left, what we're doing today is we're having separate fixed and mobile networks. And there are, besides history, there are actually also some good reasons for separating them. Because if they, they are down at the same time, that's not good, unless you have turned off your phone. And you're not reachable. But anyway, you're not reachable if the network is down. But um, we started uh, coupling fixed and mobile networks. We have a product out there at Deutsche Telekom that's called Hybrid Access that's combining both streams. And we added this to court together with the guys from Redisys. And it was presented at Mobile World Congress in San Francisco. Rüdiger did that together with the Redisys team. And we showed that you can add this function to court and you can um, make use of let's say, uh, both access types. But that is more like a sort of over-the-top combination. Now, the next thing is, uh, as I said, um, there's a proof that uh, most likely you can offload the EPC to programmable hardware. And there's a, another proof this afternoon at 3, doing again uh, advertisement for my talk, that you can uh, offload this to programmable ASICs, that, that you can offload the the BNG, so the, the fixed line functions. So what if we have one common user plane function? So we have one programmable device there, and we have something like a stratum in between that does the abstraction. Maybe we need application-specific abstraction. Um, but we have one user plane, and we just buy uh, these switches, and we put both workloads on them and uh, still have separate control planes. Because converging the control plane, which is the ultimate goal here, this is done within the 5G programs, that's the longer shot. That will take a bit longer. But I, I, I think this is going to happen. And we're right in the middle of it. And um, the UPAN work and having looked at uh, where Stratum is today made me really happy yesterday. So um, yeah, concluding my, my talk here, thank you very much. Don't, don't run away just yet. Uh, I'd like to invite all the speakers uh, from this session back on the stage. Um, and this is an opportunity in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so uh, for you, the audience members, to ask questions uh, about uh, specific things that you've seen so far in these talks or, um, in general, uh, questions, questions for the panel. So, I have a short question. How big are the test configuration for the testing the stratum? It is the hundreds servers or the switches, thousands, hundred thousands? Is this made in the simulation? So it is. How do, how do we test? How do we want to test stratum? Is that the that question? Yeah, I think what's the sort of scale at which stratum is is you know being tested and, and potentially early deployments, perhaps. Well, let's see what can I say. So I, I you know certainly uh, for just testing stratum, what we I believe the plan is we want to build a test framework so we can. Um, use the uh, right development practices for running, um, you know, every time there's a change, we get to run the full suite and run it on um, in x86, run it on hardware. Uh, from an initial deployment of uh, Stratum, I don't think we have specific plans today. The first type of deployments that we're talking about deploying uh, P4 runtime on 
are, uh, which is kind of stratum code. It might not be 100% stratum. We haven't figured that out. But it's the B4. It's that wide area network, which could be, it's, it's hundreds of devices. It would be the first type of deployment we'd use it on. Next question. Center. Um, I, I think um, the question is regarding what Google showed with its respect to the gRPC interface. And the rest of you showed different types of interfaces and options. If you could elaborate on that, whether a gRPC is a transport, and does it basically help, you know, provide similar support for open flow and, and uh, P4 runtime and all of that. And the other question is, uh, Dr. Lin's presentation was showing ORAN, and they were probably using ASN1. Is there any way to combine these two, and what's the difference? So, gRPC is a general purpose RPC, which actually came from Google, right? The G there does not stand for Google. It's a <laughs> recursive acronym. Uh, but just to clarify, GNMI, GNOI, P4 runtime are all specific interfaces, uh, basically using gRPC itself. That's their. Yeah, I, I think I think it was just uh, chosen as a transport that would um, I think be effective and convenient and work. I, you know, there could have been other other transports um, if uh, uh, that would you know at that level it should be transparent, right? Yeah, but it has support in many languages, right? It was a yeah. very sensible uh, choice, and just historically, I mean, to kind of uh, riff on what you said earlier, and I think what Amin had mentioned over the years, uh, OpenFlow is is a protocol, but it's effectively just an RPC. And uh, as Jim alluded to, not a, not, not a great one, really. Yeah, the, the wire format of OpenFlow does make yeah. it difficult, right? Harder than it should be. But you, you can understand where it came right. from. Right. Yeah. Hopefully that answered the question. Next one from the back. A uh, question about the last presentation, so for Hans. Uh, what's your view about uh, programmable ASICs versus uh, smart NICs, either or, or both? Again, there's no one ring to rule them all. It depends uh, heavily on your use case. So um, when, um, when we started Access 4.0, we looked into uh, virtualize, plain virtualization, smart NICs and ASICs, and figured out for our really heavy user plane workload, the ASICs were the best cho choice with regards to power consumption economics behind. But I'm not at all ruling out the use of smart NICs. So how we built the system is that we could also add um, we have a design where we, where we have multiple service edges, so we can still put the heavy uh, user plane load for residential or, um, let's say, the, the usual customers to ASICs, but for specific stuff, we can still add um, this functionality in servers. The, the problem with servers, uh, I mean, you should comment on that, is power consumption. Uh, so, and the smart NIC usually resides in a server. But I'm not... Not at all ruling this out. We are also working on smart NICs in our project. I would agree with smart NICs that a lot of the stuff you might do in a tour could be moved into the NIC just yeah. depending upon your deployment. Mm -hmm. so differentiation between uh, ONOS and the other SDN controller offering. Well, so uh, with Open Daylight and ONOS, they're made from the same bricks. Uh, the method of assembly was slightly different just for historical reasons, but of, you know, fundamentally they have similar functionality. Um, some excel in one area, the other excels in the other area. The kind of the purpose of looking ahead is to break from some of the shackles of the past, you know, uh, specifically with respect to us having to adapt to what the environment is. We now have a little bit more uh, leeway with respect to dictating what the environment should be with, with the advent of uh, P4 runtime, uh, plus also with uh, with the crystallization of open config uh, models, uh, we now have a better way, and GNMI and GNOI, we now have a better way of interacting with the environment, and so we can simplify things. And uh, also microservices and the frameworks that, um, uh, that allow orchestrating solutions uh, have, have blossomed since then that were not there at the time we were starting uh, building open, you know, open source uh, of SDN controllers. So it's actually, with ONOS, it was a tightly coupled solution. So actually we're, we're kind of a little bit too tightly coupled. It's monolithic. It didn't allow for offloading some of the features onto the agents of the switches themselves. 
So we're actually traveling a little bit back in the opposite direction to what Amin alluded to yesterday. You know, in the future, it's going to be more tightly coupled because to compensate for lack of Moore's law. Um, we're actually kind of opposing just a little bit pulling back in the opposite direction where we're actually getting a little bit more loosely coupled so that the solutions can be a little bit more, um, well, distributed more flexibly. And so that's, that's going to be kind of the paradigm shift from where both Open Daylight and Onos are today. Thanks. Uh, question over on the right side first. Hi. Okay, yeah. Uh, I have a question regarding scalability of uh, Onos. Uh, so will it be kind of a bold claim to kind of envision Onos being used by maybe hundreds of thousands of uh, center offices as a centralized control plane for ONOS 2.0? Not one, not, not one, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of central offices under one ONOS control? I don't think that's wow. feasible, right? Nobody's going to do that kind of a design. What you want is an ONOS cluster in each central office, right? That's what we are looking at. So if you, for example, if you look at SIBA, mm -hmm. which is a SDN enabled our broadband access that has <coughs> ONOS uh, running in it, controlling Volta, controlling an aggregation switch. But a CBA, so the scope of how ONOS is used is within that one SIBA pod. So it's a, uh, the pod design, a cookie cutter design, right? So when you want to scale, it's not like you scale that SIBA pod itself, you create more SIBA pods. Right? So that's the way it works. Okay, so before we close, I just wanted to give our speakers one last uh, opportunity for any uh, closing thoughts. So I think we'll start with Thomas. Um. I mean, I kind of said what I was going to say. I just want to invite everybody to start participating uh, and attending the ONOS TST and the UPEN, especially participating in UPEN RD in general, because I think it's going to be paramount that we build a su successful uh, kind of a, a use case with both the Stratum and the next generation ONOS or, or an equivalent slot uh, controller uh, to, to build a next generation SDN solution. Uh, I would just add that even though you know I've been talking about stratum, uh, I think that uh, technology without an application is uh, not worth much. So I'm very pleased with where the UPAN design is going, and I like the approach that you know these are building blocks, and it doesn't have to be stratum. Right? We're defining the interfaces. Stratum is one implementation. Um, you know, a good architecture lets us swap out components. Okay, number one is I could advertise for my talk again, but I'm not doing this. <laughs> um, the other thing is I, I'm extremely pleased in seeing that things we thought about roughly 10 years ago already but were not possible are now possible. And we, we see this uh, great improvement on, on the controller side, on the programmable silicon side. And I think this is, this is going to be... Um, keep us busy for the next years, but there's great opportunities there. And I'm really happy seeing this big community here also. And I hope you all support this and, and work on the ONF jointly with us to make this happen. Thanks. And Sarah? Yeah, just echoing what hans Jörg just said, um, there's a lot of work ahead of us uh, on multiple fronts and uh, a lot of exciting work. So, but um, every open source project lives and dies by the community it creates. So if you are here uh, and you're encouraging us and you like what you see yesterday, today, tomorrow, I strongly encourage the community to get involved um, wherever, um, uh, in whichever project uh, you uh, find interest in. Uh, we do a lot of them. Thanks. Awesome. So let's thank our speakers once more time. <laughs>